I, I think I think Shanghai is one of the world world's great cities. Uh, the first time I came to Shanghai, I think, was about 1999 or so, and this was right after Jin Mao had opened. Uh, Pudong Airport didn't exist at the time, so you had to fly into the old Terminal One at Hongqiao, and you know this this whole riverfront experience in Pudong didn't exist. And fast forward 17 years, and now I think the the riverfront in Shanghai is one of the best places to be. So right now we're sitting in Pudong on the river, which is the east side and Pushi is the west side. And Pushi was where, where the city sort of started and the Lu Jiazui in Pudong is where the new financial center is. And Shanghai is a city of about 25 million people and it has several districts, it has several different CBDs, it kind of these uh, pockets of office and financial development. And you know, it's just amazing what China has accomplished in the last three decades. I think, I think they've really gone from a third world country to a first world country. Um, the infrastructure especially, I think, the bridges. Uh, they've built more bridges across rivers in these three decades than I think America has built in 200 years. It's probably a hyperbole, but it seems that way. In fact, there were several tunnels. It's quite easy to get back and forth. And today we're going to take the ferry across. I, I've never actually done that. I've been here in Shanghai off and on for 10 years and have never really taken the ferry. challenges of constructing a super tall building like this start with the foundations. Beneath this building we have five stories of a basement and on that fifth basement level is what we call the raft. There is a thick piece of concrete and if memory serves it's about 4.8 meters thick of concrete. It's about 90 meters in diameter. It's a big slab of concrete that actually sits on top of piles and piles are these board uh, system of support that go down to hard pan and this challenge is really a logistical challenge because the concrete has to be poured all at once and it's a huge amount of concrete so logistically you have to get concrete plants lined up to deliver concrete to the site you have to make sure that the roads to the site don't have traffic jams so what happened with the Shanghai Tower is they started about um, Friday evening and they kept delivering concrete trucks until Monday morning very very early Monday morning to pour this one big raft that's sort of a logistical nightmare in a downtown area but it has to be done from the time the building started in broke ground in 2008 uh, there were all kinds of construction challenges that we had to deal with as architects um, from just making sure everything was safe to choosing the right material for everything. I think the the one that stands out in my mind is the the double skin, the structure for the double skin. That's sort of the struggle with architecture because each building is unlike a automobile which is designed, prototyped, built, and then you want an assembly line to build 500,000 of the same car. 
we don't get that opportunity. We have to build it right the first time. So what we're doing is building prototypes. So sometimes we get it right based on experience. Sometimes we are doing something that is so unique. And that's the Shanghai Tower, this double skin, the structure that holds the double skin, the movement to the building, and how all that works together. So we knew we were going to have a little trouble there. tallest building has opened its doors for a preview in Shanghai. Now, when it's completed this summer, the Shanghai Tower will be just 200 meters shorter than the Burj Khalifa in Dubai. Now, the tower's chief architect says that he is confident the building will fill up fast and China will avoid the so-called world's tallest building curse. So when Sears Tower was built, there was a recession. When the Petronas Towers were built, there was a recession. When the Burj Khalifa was built, there was a recession. This is not the world's tallest building, so there's no recession. So that's the world's tallest building curse, not the skyscraper curse. It towers more than 2,000 feet above Shanghai with 121 stories. It's called the Shanghai Tower. There it is. It'll be the world's second tallest building when completed in 2015. And the mastermind behind it all is Chicago architect Marshall Strebala. Marshall, it's good to see you. Oh, thanks for having us here. It's it's an incredible structure, and you've been working on this thing for what eight years eight now? Eight years, absolutely. You talk uh, about a labor of love, right? Well, it's a marathon. Doing tall buildings is not a sprint. Yeah. <laughs> wow, 128. But what might surprise you is that this super tall building is also very green. It was built using sustainable design techniques. Marshall Strabela is the chief architect of the revolutionary Shanghai Tower, and he joins us now. Marshall, thank you so much. Oh, well, thanks for having me. This is quite wonderful. It, it's kind of an odd thing to say. Uh, we try to do more with less, mm -hmm. which means we try to build our buildings with less material. And the shape of the building creates what's called disorganized vortex shedding, which is a fancy way for making it unaerodynamic. It, it takes the wind loads and reduces the wind loads the structure has to resist to the tune of $60 million. So we use less materials to build the building because of the shape of the building. This idea about starting re re really comes from the context. And the idea is Jin Mao is China's past, WFC is China's present, and the Shanghai Zhongxing is China's future. Now, Jin Mao is China's past. It's a stainless steel pagoda. It references historic Chinese architecture. WFC is a Japanese developer, foreign investment coming to China. That is China's present. China's future is a more transparent, a more open idea. And uh, the Shanghai Center was a, bu a building about not having one direction, but multiple directions. And that's why it's not one facade, but multiple facades. It, it looks in all directions. It doesn't have four facades. It has, um, it, you could say it has 130 some odd facets that go around it on each level. So this idea of past, present, and future is embodied in the three buildings. So the engineering aspect of building tall buildings was at the forefront, but this idea of three brothers that uh, speak to each other in an abstract way or in a way that someone could describe the three buildings on tours that is given of Shanghai. Why, why is that building round and the other two um, more rectangular? And I think um, modern buildings I, I find much more attractive and much more thoughtful than historic buildings, but they're still buildings, and they're still built with the way we build today. The construction method of building a one-story building or a hutong or a shikomen in Shanghai was based on how you build it. The idea and shape and form of the Shanghai Tower is planned around how you actually build it and how you construct it. So there's similarities in the method, not so much in the iconography of the building. So what one has to look at important buildings being of their time, not being historical buildings. So one thing we wanted to do is create a very, very modern building, a building that speaks to the future of China, yet forms a 
uh, collective grouping with the two other super high-rise buildings in Lujazuvi. studio head that led the design team for the 828 meter high Burj Khalifa and the drawings that we did for the project um, were very very well followed by the contractor almost almost to uh, a T. Uh, we, we designed paving patterns of astrolabs that were put into the office drop-off that came out absolutely exquisite and from a Western architect, you're used to designing very detailed drawings that get built exactly like you want. In China, there's a little bit more give and take, where in Dubai, the contractor built what was on the drawings. In China, um, the drawings aren't so complete that it allows the contractor a little bit of freedom and the client's decision-making process allows them the ability to substitute materials as long as they're equal to what was specified. So that slows down the process a little bit to open up the bidding to uh, a number of people to provide services for the project. I mean, I may be one of the last Laowais on the project. There may be a few others, but I rarely ever see a Westerner on site now and uh, most of the team that's constructing it and working on it is Chinese. And I think that's the way they wanted it. I think they wanted this to be sort of a, a very Chinese project. And I think that's one of the reasons why I stayed in Shanghai, so I can be involved with the project. One of the things that could be said about the design of the Shanghai Tower is that it's very, very similar to the Burj Khalifa. A lot of the lessons learned in the Burj Khalifa are directly translated to the Shanghai Tower. The uh, spiraling nature of the balconies on the Burj uh, were the inspiration for the twisting form of the outer skin. When we did the competition in 2006, um, competitions are a vehicle to actually express ideas that are somewhat out in left field, if you will. And the, and the idea of the double skin of the Shanghai Tower came from what we learned on the Burj. Lessons learned on the Burj were directly applied to the concept of the Shanghai Tower because when I left SOM in March of 2006 and we did the competition in July, August of 2006, so uh, three or four months later. So we had just finished up the Burj and we were now working on this new super tall building. And all the things from the wind tunnel testing and the shape of the building was incorporated into this outer skin. Specifically the fact that the burrs we had to rotate twice in order to reduce the wind loads on the building. Or better said, if we optimize the rotation of the building, the structure saw less force. And we actually did that once and had to redo the first five floors and we did it again and had to redo them. And I think uh, for all the architects, they know having worked on a project for a couple years and having to do major redrawing exercises really demoralizes a team. So the idea of this outer skin was something we could optimize independently from what we were doing on the inside. So we could have one team working on the inside and that could move a pace. And then the outer skin could be optimized. We could add more twist, less twist. So, the concept in the competition was coming up with a set of rules that enabled us to move forward rather quickly on the design of the project. So the outer skin was something we could optimize and a double skin that acts as a thermal insulation in the winter. Um, so without the Burj, I don't think the Shanghai Tower would look like it does today. The, the concepts in both buildings are very much the same. There's a very rational 
rigor of design process that went into both buildings. They don't look at all alike, but they follow similar rules of understanding. And, and I know this because I was involved with both of them.